So what can we do about the fact that the digital age in its, in its recent years has gotten a lot of bad rap because it is also doing some severe damage, including the spread of misinformation, fake news, the questioning of truth itself, the post, post-truth world, as they call it, the spread of fear and, and, and anxiety. Uh, it's linked to depression rates by, by, by constantly getting us addicted to, to, these, to these technology, which is designed, designed, persuasive technology is designed in order to get our attention, which achieves its ultimate goal when we cannot let go of it, right? And we give it 100% of this attention. So this story that we've been talking about, what can we do actually about it? Well, if we go to our framework, our conceptual framework of the, of the cube, we, we talk about then the third, the third side here, which is policies and strategies. So we have the technology, uh, the hardware, the software, and, and the human use of the technology as an extension, as an integration, the interface, the human computer interface here, um, and then and, and how it's implemented in organizations by culture, well, digitalization basically digitalizes the culture of an organization as well. Online education, think about that, right? So there's humans in the mix, a cultural change of how we go about executing the sector, which then aims at digitalizing different sectors of society, be it the social network of your friends and families, be it e-business and e-commerce, e-government, e-education, e-health, e-democracy, e-wars, cyber wars, and so forth. And now the idea is in a social constructivist sense to guide this usage of this technology in order to affect society in a positive way. We talk about policies and strategies, and policies are usually related to, uh, to the public sector. So if we all collectively as a public through our in a democracy elected officials in guide, try to guide uh, the implementation or the future of society as a whole. Uh, this is called policies. Um, and, and strategies are often also business strategies, right? We can think about the private sector more or individuals that have an idea and a vision. One good way of finding out what actually happens that, that, that I learned very quickly when I, when I was working in international policy making at, at, the, at the United Nations is you just follow the money. Right? Because many, many people's strategists, be it in the private or in the public sector, they don't always put their money where their mouth is. So if you just look at where their mouth is, what they're talking about, you might not get the best idea. So back in the days, in, in some earlier years, when I started to study these kind of like digital strategies, this is from 2003 in the government of Chile, um, which, I, which I gave uh, several technical assistance in the, in the dig, early digital strategy development agenda, you can see that back then they put most of their money already in software development. So you can see how that's designed. 16% of the money was in, in, in developing infrastructure, getting computers, uh, mobile phones, fiber optics uh, to people. Well, fiber optics was very incipient back then. Uh, a third of the money was spent on capabilities and skills to build human capacities, reorganizations of organizations, and half of the money, most of the money got spent in software development. And in which sectors? Then you can see in finance, in education, in, in defense, and in justice. So different parts of the government, especially in this digital, in this digital state strategy, was spent. Finance, for example, is uh, tax software. So in order to pay your taxes, go through a uh, through a software in order to administer who pay taxes and how. Education and, and, and defense, of course, a lot of money was spent on that. So you can follow the money in this. You can see with this cube, the cube kind of like deforms. Where, wherever the money is. So this is now we're talking about policy, public policy. This is an agenda, a digital strategy agenda of one particular country. And you can assess that also. The University of California has a digitalization strategy. And if you would map that into the cube, the cube would kind of like deform with regards to where the priorities are. Is it fostering hardware, development of new software, the, the cultural change that happens on what kind of its administration and its educational is or as research aspect is it's changing. So you can apply this cube not only to a country, you can apply it to an organization, a university, a company. All right. so. 
governments uh, are surely involved and have these digital strategies. Let's take a little bit a bird's eye view out and see actually how, ma how much resources are, are available. We talk about a meta paradigm here. The digital age is changing humankind as a whole. And who is sitting in that driver's seat? Well, if you follow the logic that I just outlined and I say follow the money, let's follow the money and see who has money in order to shape the digital revolution. If you take the top 10 digital individuals, that means uh, the, the richest people on planet Earth that made their money with, with digital technology, you can see uh, these 10 are among the, among the top 20, actually. You can see that in 2019, and you can go and, and look at the current, current values of, of the Forbes list to see what's their net worth. These top 10 digital individuals uh, in 2019 had a net worth of $634 billion. That's $634,000 million. That's what they had together. Now, that's a number. Let's see what we can make with that number. How much money is that? $634 billion. Well, that is more than the economic power of 80 countries on this planet Earth. 40% of countries together have less economic, and that's their GDP, that's everything they economically do, every salary paid and so forth, every money spent by the public sector, every, all of that together is less money than these 10 individuals have. So you can ask 40% of the world's country where to spend the money and or these 10 individuals. Try to get these 10 individuals in a room. Well, that will be a very powerful party, more powerful than 40% of countries together, right? 80 countries. You can also look at it this way. $634 billion is more than what 90% of individual countries have. So a sovereign nation, 90% of the sovereign nations individually have less economic power than these 10, these are 10 just individual men, interestingly enough, right, uh, that have more economic power than 90% of the world's sovereign states. In other words, the 90%, uh, that's uh, 171 countries out of the roughly 200 countries that we have. There are only 20 countries left uh, that have more economic power than these 10 individuals. So only 20, if you're part of one of these 20 countries, then you're part of economy that's more powerful than these 10 men together. Now, we could also go to the top 100 digital uh, entrepreneurs and individual, and then the, thing were, uh, the story would look very different. So uh, is that real power? I mean, these countries are also powerful, these you know, 80, uh, 90 percent of the countries, they are sovereign states. They hold elections. They elect their leaders or they decide their leaders or maybe it's a monarchy. There's all kind of diversities in the world. Uh, but they basically, they're responsible for their own government. Um, and these 10 individuals, they have a lot of money, but do they have power over sovereign states? Let's look at that. So some sophisticated studies have been done that show the subtlety of these power of digital companies. For example, a study back from, uh, from, from a few years ago showed that just the order of the uh, result of a search uh, algorithm, that means if you Google something, the order of how news are presented to you can swing for, uh, 40 to 80 percent of undecided voters, right? In, in the United States, in India, it's been 20 to up to 75 percent. So that's a big margin of how can I can swing voters, not by actually specifically kind of like, you know, knowing their fears or whatever. I just like try to try to reorder uh, the, the, the result of the search engine and I can affect them by a high degree. Now, the average democratic election in the world, if you take the average, is decided by a margin of 7%. In many Western countries, it's decided by a margin of 1, 2%. In the United States, they call it a landslide, like 2, 3%. If you win the vote by 2, 3 it's a landslide win. Right? So 7% is the average around the world. So swinging a vote from to 
20, 40, 70 percent. That has a big impact. And that is just the order of the search results. Now, if I do micro targeting, I know your fears and I know your anxieties. I can brainwash you much better. So that is real power that the individual that decides what search results show up has here. And that power is bigger than than most of the sovereign nations which supposedly self-govern themselves. So that's the situation that we are in. Actually, if you think about uh, who decides, shapes the digital age, there is started to be quite an imbalance uh, between the private and the public sector. And that might or might not change in the future, but we have certainly, we have both players here. We have private individuals who have business strategies that shape the digital age and we have governments, public sector who supposedly, especially in democracy, represents the general public and both of them, uh, po pro public policies and private strategies shape the kind of digital future that we are creating.